Great, everyone, thank you for joining us in person and online today for this discussion on clean cars and national security, the importance of strong standards and an increased electrification. Uh, I do have some disappointing news to start off with. Uh, Neil Chatterjee is not able to join us today because he is lampooned in San Francisco. Uh, his flight got canceled, so he sends his uh, sorrows that he can't join us today and hopefully we'll be able to get his comments uh, and feedback at a different event. Uh, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining us and introduce our excellent panel today. Uh, just to my left, or your right if you're watching online, is Mr. Richard Kidd, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience. Next to him, we have Ms. Sunju Huang, the Senior Adjunct Fellow here at ASP and former climate, uh, EDF Climate Corps Fellow at ASP. She is also a PhD student at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Thank you for being here with us. And finally, we have Mr. Stan Darbro, who recently retired as well. He's the president and CEO of Darbro Solutions and the former deputy director of the Armin Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office. So we're going to talk, hey, uh, we're going to talk all things today. Uh, we have a very short amount of time to cover a lot of ground as usual. We're going to start at sort of the, the strategic level and talk big picture issues. Uh, geopolitical implications of the electrification transition, and then uh, we'll move down to sort of the, the operational and tactical level. So we'll talk a little bit about non-tactical vehicles and then move on to uh, tactical vehicles and some of the, the really cool experimentation that's going on. Uh, so with that, I will pitch the first question to Mr. Kidd, who has been instrumental in several of the Department of Defense policies uh, in his prior service. Uh, including the, the recent greenhouse gas emissions reduction plan, the first ever. Uh, so I want to pitch it to you first, sir, to talk a little bit about uh, what you've seen across your career, how this, uh, this transition, the clean energy transition has changed, how the conversation has changed, and what it means for the Department of Defense. Um, over the years, I've, I've frequently said, you know, the country that wins the race to the clean energy future wins. Uh, so there's uh, pronounced geostrategic advantages for the United States to, to have a strong industrial base uh, around uh, clean energy. Uh, there's going to be a lot of money made and invested in clean energy, and uh, it's incumbent upon the country that we, we race forward and that we achieve a range of our objectives in terms of the, the, the clean energy transition, not just in terms of addressing climate change, but also the national security implications of having robust, secure supply chains, the ability to produce materials and items of value to, to the nation. Given this, it's also important that the Department of Defense play a role in, in uh, assisting in this transition. So I've, I've seen and been asked to do a number of things over the years to assist in this transition. And from the Department of Defense's perspective, when we are when we are asked to be part of a federal government effort using the power of our, uh, the size of our procurement, our budgets, our land, our people, it's best when the ask is aligned with a national security mission or something that's valuable to the department. So uh, perhaps the, the best case of that is building energy resilience on our installations where we know the installations will be under uh, 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 cyber and physical attack, the electric grids. So. Uh, the department is making significant investments in microgrids, on-site power storage, and uh, or on-site power generation and, uh, and power storage. In many ways, leading the standard for the country, and we're able to do that because it's important to the department, and it has all of these additional benefits. If there's not a clear advantage to the department, the ask is harder. It's harder to achieve what is being asked if we cannot, in the department, justify that in terms of some sort of mission. Uh, contribution. Uh, in terms of over time, so I started work on public sector energy and environment sustainability issues in 2007 at the Department of Energy, which was the tail end of the Bush administration. So I've worked public uh, energy for uh, across four administrations, Bush, Obama, uh, uh, Trump, and, and now Joe Biden. I would just say in the transition, you know, perhaps one of the biggest differences is in the Obama administration, there was a lot of effort that said all of the above investments. But in the Biden administration, they really mean it. Right? Not only all, so significant and strong investments in, in uh, traditional renewable energy, 
but also nuclear power, advanced nuclear, and then all of the attendant either activities or processes that are required to, to further this, this transformation, whether it's um, manufacturing in the United States, transmission, permitting, some of these type of activities. And so I think, I think that in many ways we're in a much better place than we've ever been, particularly with the, the various pieces of legislation that are going to drive wholesale change across the industries that uh, are so important for this uh, clean energy transition. Great, thank you. One of the things you mentioned was energy resilience. Can you help us conceptualize that at both the installation level and, and for the, the wider <coughs> defense community around these installations, at least domestically, what that means and what that looks like? So, so the department, the, the nation, and in fact the Department of Defense, we are vulnerable to any energy disruptions at all levels, in all phases of our activities. And things that we used to take for granted, we can no longer take for granted. We can no longer, we, you know, we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan our liquid fuel convoys were attacked, okay? We can anticipate that any conflict in the Pacific our fuel supplies, our fuel transportation, whether it's airborne or sea lift, will be attacked and disrupted. Right? So, uh, and that disruption will start to occur here within the United States. So we have adversaries that have the capability to disrupt our energy grids. And we can logically assume that, that, that this is a threat that we have to take seriously. So in terms of installation resilience, there's, uh, you know, all, not all, military installations are, are equal when it comes to the war fight. So the department has prioritized those installations that have some activity that's either critical to you know strategic asset or that have forces uh, and formations that are critical for uh, activity and identified OPLAN. So those installations have been prioritized to receive funding, uh, about 600, and very strong bipartisan support, so about $650 million a year right now is going into microgrids arguably the largest sort of single annual investment in microgrids. These, uh, the intent is to be able to secure the key mission activities on that installation to allow the, um, the forces or the formations or the assets to do whatever job that they're required to do. One job that they're required to do, of course, is also to provide deterrence. So we've got to be able to have a credible deterrence that we have uh, energy security on the installations. Now the challenge is, so we've said energy resilience and cleaner, all right, and greenhouse gas reduction. So the, the challenge on our installations is that you're still going to need firm dispatchable baseload power. And in most cases, that involves a fossil fuel component. Uh, there are some examples where you have geothermal or biomass that or in some small installations, you can perhaps have solar plus batteries, but you have the intermittency challenge with, with wind and solar and others. So this is why the department has invested so significantly in terms of next generation advanced small modular reactors and next generation geothermal. There have been two RFPs issued by uh, the Air Force for geothermal, one RFP issued and an award made for advanced nuclear up at Allison Air Force Base. So the department is going to continue to invest in, um, in those. In the report that you mentioned we provided to Congress on greenhouse gas mitigation, the good news is we believe that there is a technological pathway that gets the department to net zero and resilient on the installation side for those activities that are analogous to what you might see in the civilian sector. Uh, can't, get to net, can't get to net zero 2050 on known technology options for the operational force. Right? On the operational force, the, the construct is you must do demand reduction. So you can do a lot of things for energy efficiency that, uh, add, that add capability and reduce fuel consumption. Also, you can do fuel substitution. So uh, whether that's sustainable aviation or whether that's a small module reactor out on the battlefield uh, perhaps tactical solar in different places, you can substitute fuel, but you're never going to close the gap, all right? And, you know, the magnificent qualities of, of jet fuel are hard to replicate in mass across the globe. So uh, that the implication there for the department is we need to, and the country, we need to continue in, to invest significantly in research and development activities 
what, most of those done by the Department of Energy. And, um, and likewise, we need to start to seriously investigate the issue of some form of carbon capture and reduction. Right? So if you really want to go to net zero and you want the Department of Defense to be a contributor, at some point there's a delta in carbon emissions that has to be captured and stored. Much. I have so many questions, uh, especially about the tactical implications of all of this, uh, which I will table for the moment because I want to bring in uh, Ms. Wang and Mr. Darbro here to talk a little bit about the R&D that's going on. So Sunju, I know that you are uh, interested heavily in some of the research on microgrids. Can you talk a little bit about what your research has shown and what you're seeing across the enterprise? And then, and then Mr. Darbro, I'd love to hear more about, about your work uh, at RCCT, RCCTO <laughs> and elsewhere. So, yes, uh, I'm glad to talk about microgrids here uh, as uh, my recent research was about the uh, microgrids installation and the quantification of the ben resilience benefits of renewable energy based microgrids. So my research was about to quantify the resilience value from phasing out diesel generators and transition to uh, solar plus solar PV plus storage microgrid. So uh, in California, uh, California has been a leading state in terms of the emissions reductions and all other energy and environmental policies and uh, movements. But ironically, California burns a lot of diesel uh, to generate electricity through uh, operating uh, diesel backup generators. So I, have a, I had a question uh, how to address this ironic situation and to phase out diesel consumptions in terms of the energy generation. So uh, my research uh, quantified the resilience value from transitioning from, uh, transitioning from diesel backup generator operations to uh, solar PV plus storage microgrids, in, specifically in public buildings throughout the California. And uh, this research uh, found uh, billions of dollars of uh, benefits, economic benefits, including environmental, public health, and all other benefits um, on, a, on an annual basis. So uh, yes, microgrids can be uh, in various formats and can deploy different resources or technologies, but uh, I only focused on renewable resources basis. Uh, microgrids because it is good for the environment and it is the ultimate goal we should achieve. Ken? Maybe you should start the fact that you've recently retired and congratulations on that. But but talk about what your previous office did and, and what you've seen there. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be here today, Jessica. I appreciate that. Uh, I did recently retire in the March. The, rapid, the Army's Rapid Capability Critical Technology Office, where I worked at here in the National Capital Region, <clears throat> among one of the things that we did was worked on electric vehicles, and we worked on uh, hydroelectric was our, our main focus uh, for this area. Our job was to work with industry to finish a, an invention, complete the design, and then build a prototype and prove that it works. Our office wasn't charged with deciding whether we buy hundreds or thousands or go into production. That, that goes back into the program executive offices and the requirements folks to make those determinations. So, so, uh, uh, so we, were, we were asked to go look at, at the Bradley or track vehicle and see if we could make it a hybrid electric track vehicle. Uh, we chose the Bradley, leadership chose that. It's a small uh, frame compared to the other track vehicles. So it makes it a little more difficult uh, and uh, quite honestly, there were so many of them, it would be it's not, never easy, but it's easier to get one of those or a couple of those to, uh, to modify. So, so that decision was made <clears throat> to go do that. <clears throat> Subsequently from that, a decision was, uh, we were asked in the RICTO uh, to go look at hyper electrification of a Humvee. And the reason for that is because there's about 40, 50,000 of them still in the fleet. And they'll probably be out there until 2040 and beyond. So there's enough time to go back and look at those and make a decision as whether or not we should um, capitalize on that and, and switch some to hydroelectric. <clears throat> In the process of doing our analysis for that, we, we started looking at the JLTV, Joint Tactical 
uh, vehicle. And we looked at that and we thought, well, that, there's still time if we can, if the hydroelectric works for that, there's still time to infuse that or embed that into a production line because that's one of our newer ones coming out. <clears throat> so those are the three areas that we went to go build a prototype on. Uh, the, the, the RICTO has completed the prototype, two of them, for the Bradley. Uh, tested them. We completed the testing. Uh, <clears throat> we, you don't get 100% of everything you want. This is, uh, again, prototype to figure out what are the bounds of what you can get, what you can't get. Uh, so we did get the electric. I think in the end, they ended up with, uh, you could you go like nine miles on, on uh, mobility, which is very, very good on electric. You can get about, uh, I think they ended up uh, on these prototypes, get about four hours of silent watch. What that means is instead of starting your vehicle every 30 minutes to recharge the batteries, you can sit there and do your mission on, uh, without moving, and you can run your communications and your sensors and everything without having to go, and four hours is a big significant part of that. Anytime you don't have to run the fuel, you're saving fuel. Anytime you don't have to run those vehicles. Uh, so if you're saving, that means we have less fuel trucks on the road, less opportunities for people to take out our soldiers that are driving those fuel trucks. It makes a big difference. <clears throat> so the, that worked. Uh, there's a couple of things they need to go look at, and, and, but the, the results that came out of the Bradley hyperelectric vehicle prototyping and testing is going to feed the decision process going forward for the Army, where they go with the next uh, track vehicles, or do they go back and modify some of the ones in existence today. So those discussions are ongoing now, uh, and that worked out quite well. In terms of the Humvee, we ended up with two different companies were selected to go do the Humvees, and one was doing the JLTV. Those deliveries of those vehicles are scheduled later on this year. I, th I think they're around December. Those should, should be complete and be turned over to the, to the Army so they can actually go do the the testing and so forth that needs to be done. So that's coming along quite well. One of the things, reason we were asked to go do it is as um, when you look at a tactical vehicle versus a non-tactical vehicle, you have a couple of things that, that we need that's not out in the civilian world. So if you want to go get uh, an electrical vehicle from Ford or GM or Slantis or someone else, then you're looking for one that uses less fuel or no fuel. In the Department of the Army for tactical vehicles, we're looking for that, and we need to have extra electricity or extra power on that vehicle that's going to allow us to do those things, such as silent watch. Maybe we can power some organic equipment that is attached to that vehicle. Maybe it's a sensor. Maybe it's a, a small radar laser or something like that. Uh, there are a lot of soldier-born equipment that we now go to war with. We go to war with cell phones, we go to war with sensors, just a lot of things. And all of those require some kind of power. So it's just like when you're at home and your, your, your uh, electronics at home runs out of power, you plug in the wall, you want to recharge it. We want to be able to do that as well without having to find, go find a, a wall plug somewhere. So you have to store that power on that platform. So, so the challenge for tactical vehicles is uh, reduce the gas, obviously, right? Uh, save that and then and be able to uh, be quieter when you're doing and store that energy for those other capabilities. So it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, it requires them to look at new, new battery technology or cell technology. So we're working with industry uh, looking at some of that as well. So that's what we needed to go do. That's what they charged to do. It worked out. We proved what we needed to under Bradley. That will inform us where to go next. Now the, the other two are, are culminating hopefully into starting to test at the end of this year. Uh, where it'll be turned over to us. But that's what we were asked to go do. That's a lot to, to unpack there. Uh, and for those, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the implications of if we can get this tactical right. If we can get the tactical element right, that, that means ultimately that lives are going to be saved in the battlefield because, as Mr. Kidd alluded to, there have been significant numbers of soldiers uh, who have died. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. Um, they, they've died or been injured protecting fuel convoy lines. So if we can get this right, that really means a lot to, to saving lives, saving costs. Um, you know, and it's particularly important for the Army because the Army is the only branch that has a implementation strategy for its climate policy. And part of that is microgrids on each installation by 2035 that supports some of these things domestically as well as abroad. So uh, I want to I pivot a little bit to talking about the market 
um, and, and your office's uh, relationship with the market, the, the, the wider EV market. Um, obviously, we're not going to comment on the UAW strike or anything like that, but um, there is certainly an EV element to that. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how the market is going and some of these anti-EV amendments that have been offered on recent legislation? So, uh, so I think, you know, both Stan and Sunju, they talked about cost-benefit analysis and they said, you know, make the factors in your analysis larger. The more expansive you are, the, the more accurate that analysis should be. And so as we talk about electric vehicles, uh, we need to be uh, clear as to what advantages they do provide, what advantages they don't provide, what opportunities the Department of Defense has and what opportunities the Department of Defense does not have. So on non-tactical vehicles, yes, the Department of Defense is the second largest non-tactical fleet of the federal government, and it probably doesn't matter from a market perspective. So last year, there were 13 and a half million cars sold in America. The Department of Defense's fleet is 186. If I do some rough math, which I did on the subway this morning, that's about 0.015%. Right? You're not gonna move the market on non-tactical vehicles on 0.015% if all you're looking at is market share. And when what, you say non-tactical vehicles, can you explain a little so, bit what that means? Yeah, so non-tactical vehicle is basically a commercial vehicle that you would buy, that anybody in this room or on this web, you know, webcast could just go about and, and buy, right? So, so, it's, so the stuff that transport you around a base, that, so, so trucks right. that support infrastructure on a base. So I think we need to be cautious about making the argument for market share. We can make the argument where the Department of Defense can offer examples of how to integrate a large number of, of non-tactical vehicles onto a grid or into the operations around a, a inst an installation. So there are certainly ways that the Department of Defense can demonstrate by example for small towns and communities and cities all across America, yeah, you can operate your grid with a 40% or 50% penetration of, of EVs or hybrid electrics. What is very exciting, though, know, and where the real benefits to the department and to the country come from is the work that Stan and others are, have been doing around hybridization in the tactical environment. Because there, the Department of Defense is wrestling with questions that are directly aligned with its mission effects and which make a difference in terms of operational capability. And we always talk about capability. Uh, and um, and set, you know, in terms of market share, they're very large movers in market share. And to, uh, so, so, so that is important. Um, we should be under no illusions that we are under geostrategic competition with primarily China for the future of energy. All right, so the proposals primarily, exclusively from Republicans, to stop all investments in EV is essentially a declaration of surrender to China for the future. We have to, comp we won't win if we don't compete. And the Republicans say, we're just not gonna compete and we're gonna lock in on fossil fuels. We need to be realistic. Fossil fuels have a role to play. They're gonna be part of our energy mix for some time. But if we're not investing in the future, we can be guaranteed we're gonna lose. So, so I, I agree 100% with what Mr. Kidd said. You know, when you look at the numbers, let's, let's talk about the EVs for the, for the Army for a second. Um, while the number is large to us, when you go to industry of Ford or GM or one of those, those numbers are not as large, right? So they do millions, but they do thousands a day off the production line. So, so the thousands that the Army would want for EVs, they would probably, they could probably do it in like six months, right? They're about... We're not funded that way, right? It's not the way it works. So, so you have to buy chunks of the sum and it spreads over, in many cases, a few years. So that, that doesn't make us very appetizing to, a, to an organization that does thousands a day. Um, uh, so there's a bit of a challenge there. But in the defense world, when we do things like those uh, tactical vehicles and we do a hydroelectric, then there's not as many of those uh, uh, we're not really competing Ford and GM, you know, th th it's, it's always some of the, the other uh, companies that are building the actual track vehicle itself. So it's a big market out there. They're very interested in that. 
um, there, are, there are potential opportunities in the future for the Army to do some uh, EV for tactical vehicles, such as the Scout vehicle. It's a small vehicle. Uh, looking at doing that, it's not out there all the time, so it's time to bring it back and charge it. You know, one of your challenges with a tactical vehicle is as you're pursuing the bad guy, you can't look at him and put up a little flag and say, time out, I have to go charge my vehicle. They don't really, they're probably not going to do that. So, so you have to recharge as you go along, or you have to have the hybridization that the engine run in order to recharge the batteries again. Now, as, as battery cell technology gets better, then of course that lasting will, will, will go even longer, right? Industry's working that very hard. So, uh, but that's part of the challenge for a tactical vehicle. You need to be, re, be able to recharge. So it's not definite, no, on EVs for tactical, but it's very strategic on which ones you might be able to do that with. Uh, so that's a challenge. And then getting industry, uh, such as uh, like I, I've used many times, Ford and GM, Slantis and others, getting them interested, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a challenge because, again, it, they can do what we want in a matter of a few months. And... Um, uh, we can't consume those probably in a matter of a few months. It takes a while to get rid of the old, bring in the new, and that sort of stuff. Um, but we've had, I've had those discussions actually with Ford and the others. And it's a challenge. It doesn't mean they wouldn't help us, you know, and, and look at that. It just becomes a challenge. Fair. Uh, but EVs and DEVs are also not without risk, right? Um, I just saw some, some reports uh, out of Florida that talked about um, the fact that uh, some of the folks in the hurricane zone needed to, to make sure to park their Teslas outside because there's a reaction that occurs uh, with salt water uh, with the lithium ion batteries. So is there any um, analysis happening? I'm sure there is, but can, you, can anybody talk to how we should rack and stack where EVs are deployed and how they're deployed? With, again, you know, what are some of the niche things where the Department of Defense can, can uh, offer advantages? Well, basically, almost every battery in the Department of Defense has to be able to be exposed to salt water and continue to operate, all right? So think of all the batteries on all the Navy ships, all the batteries on the Marine Corps equipment, all the batteries on the aircraft that go to sea, and all the batteries that are shipped uh, uh, in the sort of large bulk shipment of the Army's brigade combat teams. So the Department of Defense is arguably the leading investor in research and development on batteries and their ability to withstand harsh elements. All right? So there's a lot of investment going on in battery technology by the Department of Defense to address these very issues, which will have benefits for the public sector. So I just say that's an example of where the Department of Defense, I think, is arguably leading the way. So in terms of electric vehicles and natural disasters, so the electric vehicle offers fuel diversification and the ability to provide transportation services and mobile batteries. So you've all read the stories of the Ford F-150. Power goes out. It actually goes back and powers the house off your, your Ford F-150. If you have uh, rechargeable assets like some of these portable charging stations uh, that can operate off the grid, you can continuously charge those electric vehicles even if you don't have grid service power. So there's a certain advantage for fuel diversity. And the Marines have done a good job of this in their acquisition strategy around non-tactical vehicles. They have distributed <coughs> charging stations that allow those vehicles to charge and provide transportation services in the event of a grid outage. So um, I hope that was helpful in answering your question. I sort of strayed along there. Started with salt water exposure and ended up back with the Marines. I guess that's OK. That's, there's, a, there's a certain logic there, all right. The, um, the, the batteries and, and the challenge of being able to um, securely move them and, and uh, without creating fires or hazards, uh, those kinds of things. It's not new. Batteries have been there for years and years and years. The issue now is, as we change, as industry changes the recipes within the cells of those batteries to give us more energy at one time and to be able to make that energy last longer, they have to change the recipe of how they do those cells and those batteries. That's what industry is trying to do for us. And it's very, very challenging to do that. So um, 
uh, as they do that, then there's some inherent risk that may come along with that that makes them a little more, needs a little more protection as, uh, as, you know, when you transport them, whether it's on a ship or on an aircraft or, or by land. Uh, but again, this isn't something new. We've always had to worry about that, right? So it's something that we always give, uh, give a lot of thought to. Um, and as Mr. Kidd said, the Army is, and the Department of Defense is really strong at looking at battery development technology where it's going. At Aberdeen Proving Grounds, there's an entire element up there, and C5 ISR is what they call it, and they focus just on uh, battery technology and where are we going with that. So uh, uh, Dr. Ruth is a, is a lead up there doing it. She's a fantastic job up there and her team. Uh, I've been there a couple of times and looked at it. So they're working really hard with industry and very attentive to them. So how do we, you can't just make a battery, a different battery, a different size for every vehicle, right? So is, there's, it would cost too much and, and, uh, and not work very well. So you have to look at where, how do we commonize that, how do we make it common, and then you want to be as common with industry and commercial as possible. It drives the cost down. Uh, everybody knows by volume, you buy more, you get, you get it for less. So uh, we want to do that. That helps the economy. It doesn't just help the warfighter. It helps the economy as well. So those kinds of, of parameters and metrics are those things that are being looked at. How, how do we do that to be common? And how do we uh, continue to protect it as they change those recipes and maybe make them a little more uh, susceptible for having problems? So how, how might we protect that? So that's being done across the board uh, with everything. Uh, and it's not just working here in the United States. You know, you, you look at other foreign countries, and, and we're working with them because they have technology too. They have very smart people. So what are they doing, right? So when uh, last time I talked to Ford, they had done, they set up a joint venture in South Korea for battery development. So each of them are reaching out different places. How, how, do we, uh, how do we do that and how do we make it go forward? And most importantly, or very important, how do you do that safely? How do we, we uh, take care of it that way? Uh, it's nothing like getting on an aircraft and, and the guy flying it or a lady flying it looks at you and says, are you sure that battery's safe? <laughs> it is. So they want a little proof that it, that it is. So that's, that we looked at very early on in the process. And both of you have touched on something that I want to I want to anchor on in just a minute. Uh, sorry for the Navy term, um, and that is that this is not a recent thing, right? Like this whole concept of of emissions reduction may may be more um, present now uh, in a different way. But Mr. Kidd, you said this is something that this is something you've been working on since 2007, right? And one of the things that I noticed from the greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction plan was that the DOD writ large has been continuing on a downward trend of emissions since you started keeping track. So this is not a recent thing, but rather the next step. This is, this is what we're doing. It's not a woke thing. This is, this is part of a wider process. Can you talk at all about how that's changed in your, your tenure? Well, I mean, you have public officials back to the first President Bush <clears throat> who's spoken about the reality of climate change and the vulnerabilities that liquid fuel so, uh, and the Department of Defense, as you said, has been uh, very effective in uh, reducing our over, so, how should I say, so the amount of capability that we get out of each gallon of fuel has increased over time, right? So if you go to the Department of Defense and say you must reduce your greenhouse gas emissions for the, only the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that leads you on a logic path that's not going to be uh, either successful or embraced by uh, anyone in the political spectrum or in the department. Instead, if you go, hey, Department of Defense, you have to reduce your fuel-related vulnerabilities, add capability, ensure that each gallon of fuel is used to maximum effect, then the department can make and has made significant progress. And as the report points out, there's plenty of more opportunity for the department to take steps to improve our capability while reducing our greenhouse gas reductions. But right now, under the current technology mix, that beneficial trade-off stops somewhere before net zero. So you're still going to have uh, some emissions uh, results. And let's just put this in perspective. So the U.S. Department of Defense, our scope one and two emissions, uh, largest single emitter in the United States, if, if the Department of Defense was up at UNGA last week for Climate Week, you know, we would have been uh, about the 56th or 57th the largest uh, country in the UN General Assembly. So 55 countries in the world emit less greenhouse gases than the Department of Defense. 
And we have no idea, but we believe that our scope three emissions, those embedded in the supply chain, are at least equal to, if not greater, than the scope one and two emissions. So there's a lot of emissions there and a lot of room for improvement. And we should take every opportunity for improvement when it expands capability. All right? where, you're, where the country's going to have problems if you say, all right, you Department of Defense, you have to ration fuel or have to lose capability for the reason of emissions reduction. And that's, and, and that's where the, you know, once you get to that point, and, uh, you know, then the benefits are no longer there for the next incremental step. Right? So it's economics, it's, but it's all of these other attendant things, not just cost. I'm glad you brought up supply chains, though, because this, this uh, speaks to something that you, you talked a little bit about earlier, and that's China, right? This, the, this is about competing with China. China currently dominates the crit critical minerals extraction and refining supply chain. Um, and, and you spoke about the need for us to get in the ring and actually compete. Um, and there's, there's some of this element um, kind of in every industry across uh, the federal interagency. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's going on in the supply chain and, and how that impacts the way that you're thinking about all of this stuff? Deal with that. <clears throat> as we as we look at that, uh, as we look at the supply chain and figure out where it's coming from, there has to be enough interest out there in the industry to build the components that we need, right? Uh, you have to look at the manufacturing plants. Are there are there uh, manufacturing lines set up to handle the influx? Of, uh, of the, of the uh, new equipment and things that we need. You know, it's interesting when we did the Bradley hydroelectric vehicle, there was about 18 or 19 different subcomponents on that vehicle that need to be either replaced or put on in order to make it a hydroelectric vehicle. Of those 18 or 19, most all of them already existed, already out there, right? So we had to do uh, some uh, electric drives and, and make those and make them big enough to handle the vehicles that we wanted to go do. And then you have to take those different components from the supply chain that's out there today, and you have to integrate. They haven't been integrated. So it's not you just go buy them off the shelf and plug them in. You have to actually integrate them, and that takes, that takes a level of effort that has to be done. So a lot of those components that you need for electric vehicles and hydroelectric, a lot of them are existing today, but not necessarily been integrated with each other uh, uh, for any particular vehicle you're putting them on. That needs to be done. Where are those parts coming from? When you put in a part on your car, you don't want it to break in six months and have to go back to the dealer and say, I buy another one, and they say, well, I'll give it to you cheaper. You're looking for it to last the time you have your vehicle. It's probably not going to work that way, but that's what you want. Well, that's, that's the same thing we worry about in the department, right? How, many, how long are these components going to last? And the, a function of how long it lasts is also a function of the quality of work and components that was used to build those. So where that stuff comes from and where components come from is part of a supply chain uh, concern or challenge. Did we get them from this country or that country? And if we end up in another process like, uh, like we did with COVID, then are some of these places that have small density items that they built, are they going to shut down? Are we not going to be able to get those parts? That, that problem's not solved yet, right? It, was, it really came to light when we had COVID uh, and you go order things. Uh, uh, it may not be electric, but I'll give you an example. My wife and I bought a, a table from uh, uh, Lazy Boy, and it took us 10 months to get it. I'm like, why is it taking 10 months? It came from overseas. Who knew? A piece of metal and some wood came from overseas, and COVID delayed it. So that's just a table. So there are many things that are delayed in industry because uh, of, the, of things like that, such as COVID, or not building enough of them to make it worthwhile, right? So uh, there are several times we're doing prototypes, and I'd have a small company that's delivering a part for us. And then we would get notified there's going to be a three-month or a six-month delay on getting that done. This happened with us with the Bradley. And I'm asking the, the uh, vendors, why is it a delay? Well, it's a small company building this fan. Where are they at? Anaheim. I'm on my way to Anaheim. So I had to go out there and explain to them the importance of what they're doing and the work that they're doing. And then, and then uh, once we did that, they kind of moved us to the front of the line and we got the parts that we needed. So your supply chain is very, very important. If you don't watch it, you don't pay attention to it, you don't know where it's coming from, that's a problem. You know, we did uh, parts for, for not electric, but other parts, and they came out of uh, 
some stuff came out of um, um, Norway, and we had stuff coming out of Ireland and stuff coming out of you know Sweden and other places. And and you have to know where it's coming from or where are they getting their parts from and how long is it going to last? How many times you add electric to it and then you turn it off and you turn it on and you turn it off and you do that several thousand times? That starts to wear on those electronic components, right? So how long does that last? And there's standards for that, and we have to watch that as, as that uh, as that happens and moves forward. Department of Defense or each of the service branches are thinking about that. Is there a particular office that is that is thinking about that? Uh, <laughs> I think they're all looking at it. It isn't, it isn't new. It just be, the more digitized the United States becomes, then the more opportunity the bad guys have of, of giving us, uh, and, and other people, giving us substandard equipment and parts. So, so your supply chain, although it's always been important to us, it becomes more important as we, uh, as we digitize and we get more advanced capabilities out there. So... Uh, so I think we're all looking at it. Every service is looking at it. There's an office uh, within the Office of Secretary of Defense that specifically looks down and says, is there a capability that is hurting our warfighters that we need to go engage with industry? And they will go directly to industry and say, here's what we need, here's how we need it. And our laws allow us to go do things and put importance out there if that's what we need to do to protect this nation. And I imagine the Defense Innovation Unit, I wish we could have somebody from there is thinking a lot about that. Can you talk, either you talk a little bit about the DIU and then I'll switch gears a little bit from you to, to bring you in a little bit more about the, the actual standards themselves. Can you talk about what the Def Defense Innovation Unit is doing either for battery technology and storage or looking at supply chains? I take that first. If, so, okay. So we've, we've my organization, we, we talked to the DIU uh, several times and went and chatted with them. Um, I don't know all their particular programs that they're working on now, uh, but they, they have a the similar job that the RICTO does, uh, only they're doing it at the, uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense level, and they work for a lot of customers that support anything that we go in, we ask them to go do. Uh, I know they were looking at hydroelectric vehicles as well, and they were working on some of those issues, and there's challenges with the batteries. I didn't stay all the way up to date on which particular ones they were doing. It's doing a lot too, right? Uh, and they're, they're working uh, back and forth as well. You hear a little less about a DARPA only because they, they, it's a little secret squirrel, right? But they're doing a great job as well, yes. Delay the deliveries. Uh, I want to address uh, the different commodity nature of batteries or minerals and oil and gas, fossil fuels. So, for example, any delays in mineral deliveries uh, is would be different from the delays of the oil and gas supply. So, uh, I mean, oil and gas delivery will simultaneously, almost simultaneously affect our daily lives. But uh, any delays in mineral, critical mineral uh, supply or delivery may not be the same. So we do have a uh, different commodity nature uh, in terms of the uh, critical minerals versus oil and gas fossil fuels. And also, um, in terms of the uh, China's dominance on uh, critical minerals, I think we can take different strategies uh, to address this issue. First, uh, the U.S. should uh, diversify its sources of mineral supply and also to seek um, local, to localize manufacturing. Uh, because it should be noted that China dominates the supply chain of critical minerals for now, but uh, they are also the net importer of those materials. And at the same time, um, oh, so uh, we should develop supply chain through international trade and um, collaboration efforts such as USMCA or IPEF. And at the same time, we should lower the dependence on um, critical minerals in manufacturing EV batteries itself. And uh, briefly, some advanced technologies today are showing promising future to reduce uh, the use of uh, critical minerals in making EV batteries. So we should keep and further develop these technologies. And also, we should aim for a circular economy of uh, EV batteries and critical minerals. So unlike fossil fuels like oil and gas, EV batteries and critical minerals can be recycled. 
and massive inventories of these materials can be stored for a relatively longer period. And uh, these materials uh, should be and can be secured in advance uh, under uh, the National Defense Stockpile or uh, the Defense Production Act. Great summary. I'm going to want your notes afterwards. That was just very boom, boom, boom. These are all the things that we need to do. Uh, going back to my earlier remarks, well, first of all, we have to agree that we're in competition and we have to compete, right? So we're not going to do those things if we don't uh, compete. You know, the good news is in terms of having watched the national defense strategy, so Secretary Mattis was very clear when he wrote his national defense strategy about this notion of competition and, and that it goes beyond just fighters and ships and missiles. It really is all aspects of the economy. We like to think of the free market. Well, China doesn't think of a free market. They have an industrial policy, and there are certain uh, industries and technologies and supply chains that they uh, want to control. Uh, you know, the good news is that articulation from Secretary Mattis' uh, uh, NDS has carried through to this current administration, right? And so there is a generally a strong support for that. Um, in, in terms of supply chain, I really liked your practical, this is what we need to do. Uh, we, we shouldn't hyperventilate, we shouldn't get too excited, and, and it, but we should be deliberative and make the investments in industry, make the partnerships and the trade agreements that will help to address some of these supply chain issues. And we need to bet on American innovation to, to develop these new materials and chemistry. So, uh, we should be absolutely be concerned about these supply chains, but we shouldn't get too hysterical just yet. All right? I think we have the capabilities to uh, address them. An interesting thing about supply chain, though, and ESG, which has been getting some reports, and scope three emissions, right? We talk about supply chain integrity from a variety of factors, right? So whether it's uh, uh, the Fukushima plant that cut the power and all the little plastic gizmos that hold the cars together, the whole world sort of shut down there for a couple months. So you've got supply chain integrity and exposure to national disasters, nefarious actors, uh, political events, whatever the case may be. Well, how do you know where your supply chain is? All right, what is your supply, where is it and how do you know where it is? Well, one way is through understanding your scope through greenhouse gas emissions. If a company, so a, 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 quick, a clean, supply chain is generally a secure supply chain. So one, if you know where your supply chain is and it's cleaner, then that probably means your supply chain is in North America or Europe, right? Which would, is a, so it's an easy surrogate, non-standard metric uh, that I think we should not be dismissive of. In terms of actors inside the building, everybody is concerned about supply chain, so within under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, you have a couple of offices devoted exclusively to supply chain integrity and supply chain resilience, and they are deploying some of those tools that were talked about, the Defense Production Act and other items. You also, under the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, have offices that you have a power and energy group that's making all of those significant investments that Stan talked about and coordinating the different investments across the services. And in terms of batteries, there's a whole of government effort. So the Federal Consortium of Advanced Batteries, FCAT, you could take a, a look at that. It's, a, it's primarily the Department of Defense and Energy, but other departments are, are present. And it's developing a national strategy around all of the components of the supply chain, the manufacturing, the research, the deployment uh, around batteries. So it's a great resource to take a look at uh, where the United States is. And right now we're not in a good place, but where we're going, I mean, there is a plan and there is, uh, you know, should be plenty of positive ex expectations that our current situation will get better over time. Follow up. That, that, I, that was great points. The, the um, supply chain issue is not new. I just don't want people to think it's new. It's not new. We've had supply chain, we've had concerns, and you have to do risk mitigation on that from, for years, right? Uh, I've had these same conversations with Honorable Shu, that is the uh, OSD R&E. Uh, she's tracking that. Her entire staff is tracking that. Um, I have been to every major 
foundry on the globe, personally, that does, just the major ones that, that do chip development, right? And that's, that's important to us. They, they have, uh, I've been to uh, Shanghai and some cities outside, just on the outskirts of it, in Taipei, Taiwan, and the outskirts, and Silicon Valley, and, and up in New York, and, and uh, it's a concern. They all know it. Uh, it is not just isolated to EVs. It is across the entire department and across our, our, uh, our nation as, a, um, as we look forward to, to doing things. So, so it's, uh, it's being watched. The, the thing isn't to just accept risk. The thing is to come back and figure out where that risk is in that supply chain, and then, then how do might we mitigate that if that risk becomes a reality, right? So it's only a risk till it happens, then it becomes an issue. So, so we put in places in the department to figure out what might happen if that becomes an issue. What is the mitigation that we need to do? Is it another supplier, right? Is it the way we change things? Do we stockpile more? So all of those things go into the calculus of how, how we move forward, how do we handle the supply chain. So it's, it's very important, not just tied to, um, uh, to the electric, but uh, anyways, I wanted to share it with you. May I jump in? So, so on supply chain, you know, it's a, most, we need strong, consistent bipartisan support. And it, the supply chain doesn't get the attention that it needs. Case in point, is you know one manufacturing 155 millimeter artillery rounds. All right, so this is a a, a pre World War One technology. We had massive capability to do it, but there was never the political will to maintain that capability, to pay for a production line, to to be functional but not used, or to pay for the right amount of stockpiles. So many of the uh, of the very correct uh, steps that need to be taken have to be paid for. There has to be a political will to put money out there to stockpile materials. There has to be a political will to invest in critical mineral recycling, right? That's not going to make money, at least not in the beginning. So you're going to need some government support for some of these activities to develop the first of kind or to develop the processes that are so important to national security. But it's hard. There's a lot of will to build a fighter jet, uh, not as much will to stockpile critical materials. So. You know, for those of you in the policy arena, the think tank arena, you need to continue to agitate for stockpile and supply chain resilience, whether it's high-tech chips or, you know, low-tech 155 rounds. I got to say, I mean, I knew that this issue was complicated and these issues are complicated, but and at the risk of sounding like a doe-eyed teenager, I'm heartened to hear that there are so many really dedicated, brilliant folks thinking about this and really getting into the weeds with how complex this is. Um, so thank you for your work. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit before turning it over to, to audience Q&A. Um, I want to talk for a minute just about the standards themselves for EVs and greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, earlier, no, late last year, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency finalized the strongest ever standards for heavy duty trucks. And in the spring of this year, they announced new proposed standards for light duty and medium duty vehicles. Uh, and this question is primarily for Sunju, but anybody else can, of course, chime in. Um, what do you think that these rules mean in practice, and, and what does this mean for the industry? Yes, um, in 2021, the US EPA had, uh, announced the Clean Trucks Plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, air pollutant emissions uh, from vehicles, uh, from heavy duty vehicles. Uh, as the first piece of the three rule makings, in December 2022, the US EPA uh, uh, finalized the uh, established the final rule to set the str strongest standards for heavy duty trucks. And uh, the rule um, was designed to reduce air pollution, including uh, particulate matters and any um, pollutants that create ozone and particulate matters from heavy duty vehicles, um, starting, uh, starting in model year 2027. So, and the, um, this rule has a particular focus on nitrogen oxide emissions reduction. And EPA estimates that this rule would uh, reduce almost 50% of nitrogen oxide emissions uh, from heavy duty vehicles um, by 2045. And that will yield about $30 billion of net, uh, annual net benefits. And these include uh, public, benefit, public health benefits, including um, fewer premature deaths. So this year, 
EPA also proposed the other two rulemakings. And the first one, the uh, EPA has proposed to, new, to set new greenhouse gas emission standards for heavy duty vehicles um, in model years 2027 and later. And uh, the rule would reduce about 2 uh, billion ton, metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions from heavy duty trucks between 2027 and 2055. And, and EPA estimates about two, two to 300 billion uh, net benefits with this rule. And as for the other rule, uh, EPA announced this April new proposed standards to reduce multi-pollutant emissions from light duty and medium duty vehicles. Uh, this is again uh, starting with the model year 2027 and this rule uh, would reduce uh, various emissions like greenhouse gases, nitrogen oxide, and particularly matter emissions from light duty and medium duty vehicles. So altogether we expect these new standards would significantly uh, reduce emissions from vehicle side. Uh, yielding societal benefits to our communities because reduced air pollutant emissions uh, improve our air quality and this can lead to public health benefits and also address some uh, environmental justice because it can provide benefits to vulnerable communities near roadways where people are disproportionately uh, exposed to air pollution from vehicles. And um, also the greenhouse gas emissions reduction part can help climate change mitigation. And this provides not only public health benefits, but also the resiliency by reducing the risk of climate hazards or climate disasters. As we all have witnessed floods, uh, wildfires, uh, hurricanes, and any climate-related extreme weather events all occur all across the United States. Anybody else want to comment? So policy and regulation matters. All right, so uh, it may make a difference. So you see in Europe uh, a more advanced policy and regulatory environment, which is driving a range of positive benefits uh, for for their societies. The thing about societal benefits, though, they are they could be large, but they're diffuse. And maybe you might have thirty billion dollars worth of societal benefits, but you might have one billion dollars of concentrated cost on the trucking industry, and that then stimulates political economics. So you have to understand who is bearing your costs and how can you address that. In terms of the costs, again, a technology coming out of the Department of Defense that can help in this is um, <clears throat> we also have a large number of medium and heavy duty wheeled vehicles, all right? Think of them as trucks, all right, uh, that are on the battlefield technology uh, sometime, some of them tracing back to the late 1900s, or late uh, 1990s uh, or so. Uh, we have demonstrated and are deploying as a matter of a program of record aftermarket hybridization kits on these trucks. That reduced the fuel consumption between 17 and 22 percent, and in some cases allow the truck to export, uh, export power as part of a bi-directional microgrid. So that's, that's fixing you know, technology that's 20 years old, going forward, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity. So when given the right policy environment, I am confident that American industry and American innovation can respond to the challenge. If I could, you know, electric vehicles, hyper-electric vehicles, it, they don't have to be, it's not the most important thing to go fund. But it has to be important enough to fund it. It doesn't have to be number one priority, but it has to be important enough to go fund it. So that's what, that's what our Congress needs to do, is figure out, is it important enough to go fund it in what areas? And that has to happen. Um, the department is, is absolutely tracking. Uh, for, for the program executive office that does those me and wheeled vehicles and stuff for the Army, uh, Brigadier General uh, Luke Peterson. I know Luke, uh, we're friends. I've chatted with him on this subject several times. He is uh, uh, tracking it, he is keenly aware, and he is supportive of going out there and, and figuring out how do we do that for those vehicles, okay? But again, it's not free. I just had a conversation two months ago over that. It's not free. So, so your hydroelectric and electric doesn't have to be the most important, but it has to be important enough to fund it so we can do it and move those things forward. 
sort of simplified, I think, way to, to describe how important these things are and these increased standards and this transition is, is, you know, less pollutants in the air means better air quality. It means you're going to have healthier communities. And um, this is not the subject of this particular panel, but it does have an impact on military recruiting because asthma is a disqualifying factor for, for being in service. And that can, can lead to, um, you know, better or worse in, uh, impacts to our service members as well as their families. I mean, so this stuff really matters. Uh, and I'm going to do one final question here, and then I'll turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, how do we ensure that the U.S. and American workers are a main beneficiary of a clean energy transition? You mentioned it a little bit uh, about investing in innovation, but what are, are there specific steps or specific things that you would like to see that can help facilitate this in a way that benefits the most? I think in many ways this is an inherently political question beyond the Department of Defense I question. I it that way. <laughs> so, so the clean energy transition will be disruptive to incumbent industries and practices, right? And you see that in the strikes that are going on right now in the American car industry. The prevalence of electric vehicles with also driving assistance for self-driving vehicles going to be extremely disruptive to the automobile service sector, manufacturing and service sector. Right? We have to acknowledge that. Right? Same way as we reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, petrochemical, or coal, that you're going to, um, uh, you know, those towns and those communities that benefit from those economic activities will be disrupted. And will be arguably the most likely source of opposition to any transition. So I'm, I would just think that any solution, any wise politician would embed into their policy solutions activities that bring those communities on board. And in terms of the energy space, you, you know, a couple that I've taken a look at is, is uh, you know, taking a small module reactor and putting it on the brownfield that used to be a coal plant, right? It's, it's a smaller number of jobs, uh, but it's a higher paying set of jobs. Likewise, take part of the fossil fuel industry that's right now is looking for the, you know, the next uh, gas well and make them part of the advanced geothermal energy because it's the same technology, right? It's the same technology from hydraulic fracking to advanced geothermal. So there should, there should be a recognition of this and deliberative inclusion in any policy to take care of these effective what the best policy inclusion is and how you do that, that's going to be something for, for, others to, for others to address. But for those of you who are in favor in a, of a clean energy transition and you're not worried about the welfare of coal miners or, or wildcatters or people on the assembly line, you're not going to get what you want if you're completely dismissive of the very legitimate concerns for, from people and fit, that need to put bread on the table for their families. Virginia, so I'm fascinated by this coal to nuclear transition, um, the potential there. Uh, but Stan, you look like you had something you wanted to add. I would like to comment on the policy, and, and <laughs> I agree, that is hugely politically charged, so I'll be very careful. Can you uncharge Well, I just, it, it's not the first time we've had political issues like that that had to be addressed and, and Congress had to go tackle. Um, if we go, go back, there is a, a um, legislation and policy today, and it's called the Berry Amendment. And the Berry Amendment talks about fabric. And in short, it says, uh, in part, that if, you, if we want to use fabric, I think parachutes or, or uniforms, if we need, or airships, if you want to use fabric, you must first try to buy it from a U.S. source. That's what the policy says. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. So, uh, and we do that stuff very, very well, but that protects the United States industries on how, how we might protect things. Maybe there's some kind of policy out there that where it talks about as we do EVs and hybrid EVs, is there, maybe they ought to think about in the policy, should we put something there that says buy America, right? That, maybe there's something like that you do. Um, and industry does very well with that. If you go to New Hampshire, there's a plant up there. Uh, when you walk in, it looks like you step back into the 1800s, 1700s. Uh, and they've been doing the parachutes or fabric for since WW2. And they're still doing stuff today. I am doing uh, airships, fabrics for airships up there. Very capable, very good at doing it. Dover, Delaware, 
uh, has a has an organization up there. Uh, they built uh, early on. They built most of the spacesuits for all the astronauts. They're all tailor made. Today comes small, medium, and large. I guess I'd take a small, but. Uh, uh, but they build them there, and now they're, they're making them in other places as well. But that, all those places and all those things that you hear about on TV that have to do with, you may not be thinking fabric, but industry is. And there's a policy out there that says you can't, doesn't say you can't buy it somewhere else, it says you have to look here first, and you have to meet some criteria if you're not going to buy it here, you're going to buy it abroad. Maybe there's policies like that they can think about for EVs and things like that. Fascinating. Uh, yes. Uh, we'll get to questions. I think we have a mic. Uh, do we have a mic? Um, and in the interim, you know, ASP has a great report on Section 232 tariffs uh, with a particular case study on, on aluminum. So uh, feel free to check that out. But we are not going to get into trade or labor policy here uh, unless nobody has questions. Okay. <laughs> yes. Testing. Ah. Thank you so much for being here today. This was a really enlightening conversation, and we have plenty of audience members online who have submitted questions, and apologies if we do not get to all of them today. Um, going off a good question already asked by our moderator about supply chains and making sure that American workers are taken care of, most critical minerals are located in the global south using quite cheap labor, supplies, and transportation. A recent discovery of a large lithium mine in the United States is an opportunity to onshore. But, of course, labor standards and wages are much higher here than they are in, for example, Peru and Bolivia, two of the second largest sources of lithium. How would you balance wanting to invest in global infrastructure and compete with China through mechanisms like the IRA and the onshoring movement, which obviously wants to cut down on reliance on vulnerable international supply chains? How do you balance the need of taking care of workers at home with taking care of our international commitments and our competition? Thank you. Thank for office up here, whoever asked that question. <laughs> Does anybody want to take that? Go to Rich. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, uh, um. So a couple of things ab about that. So uh, I think that as the United States, we should be, we should ensure that the market has full information about the supply chain. So supply chain and the sources of supply. So if we take a look at conflict diamonds or conflict minerals, uh, we have some models for how we can capture and reflect the data about sort of horrific working conditions into the marketplace. Uh, we cannot, but the reality is we cannot right now boycott or eliminate supply from countries where the working conditions do not match those of the United States. We have to have those minerals right now, particularly in the next five to seven years as we transition. And then we need to continue to bet on American innovation and discovery of new sources and materials. Earlier this week, I was at the Norwegian Embassy where there was a presentation, if you guys were tracking, Norway has now been the first to approve deep sea mining of critical uh, um, uh, minerals and metals. So here we have a strong US ally, whole new source coming online. Good morning. Um, so hopefully I'm fair in saying that China's governmental structure allows for it or enables it to better control, advance internal, um, internal security, internal investment. So with that said, for the U.S., for us, um, I guess my question has two parts. And one, if you can't answer, that's fair. Um, but kind of if a genie said to you, okay, today he, I'll grant your wish, but how do you fund it? Um, you know, domestic investment in our national security. Um, do, are you all able to share insight on where the money uh, can be found, whether in the government budget, um, you know, right, whether in our government budget, and if not, um, are there conversations to redirect or incentivize the private sector to invest um, and to spur 
this innovation and, and um, you know, to spur the, the processing of the money where we need it. And then my second other kind of question is just, um, as far as the national conversation, everyone being on the same page, Congress, everyday Americans about what we need, um, what can be done there to better have that conversation? First, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege here. Uh, as for bettering the conversation, that's part of ASP's mission. We are, we are a nonpartisan organization whose, our, our sole mission as an institution is to educate and inform. And that's what we do by convening these events. We actually go out into the states and try to meet people where they are and talk to them. Um, so that's part of our national climate security tour where we, we take these panels on the road. Um, and we try to talk to people wherever they are. We just did one in Arizona um, where we talked all things heat um, and, and in the Inflation Reduction Act. And that sort of gets to the previous question and then I'll toss it to anybody else. Um, there has been an onslaught of <laughs> federal legislation with available funds to try to, I don't want to say subsidize, but I guess it is a subsidy, uh, or fund with grants or incentives to facilitate the clean energy transition. So there's the Chips and Science Act. There is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And then there is also the Inflation Reduction Act. And that's just what's happened in the past several years. There's other things that have happened, and I really wish that Mr. Chatterjee was here to talk about it, because um, FERC is also doing a lot on the permitting front, which, because if you do clean energy products, you need to be able to connect it to the grid uh, and do these things, and you need certain permits. So I think there's widespread support for uh, reforming that process, because it's very cumbersome and very slow, but we want to be sure that those, any reforms uh, account for environmental concerns, environmental justice concerns, um, as well as you know, making, making the best decisions with the best information possible. Um, so with respect to, uh, I'll just mention this last thing about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, in July, the Department of Energy released its guidance for every state to submit its application to get its share of the Inflation Reduction Act funds. So there, there are, Three, I think it's three, $360 billion worth of, of incentives and funding for states to go after. Um, some states with the infrastructure already in place to roll these out have already done provisional agreements. So California, Texas, uh, and Vermont, but Vermont is, is holding theirs for now because they're at capacity. But they already have that stuff in place so they can start to roll out some of these incentives. Um, other states have, I believe, until next August to submit their application for how much of those funds that you want. And I'm happy to talk more about that um, offline, so, so find me after. Um, but I will then yield the floor now to, to the rest of the panel. I'll hit the China thing for a minute. Uh, those are great, great questions. Let me start with saying that every country does not work the same way the United States does, right? We all know that. Everything's are not equal across the globe. Um, the example I use with China, uh, when I was over there in 2015, somewhere around that time frame, then Shanghai, and the group of us met with industry, and we met with what we equivalent of the Chamber of Commerce in, in, uh, in Shanghai. So when we met with them, one of our concerns was a separation between allowing industry to do things to supply the, the world and, and make decisions on technology and so forth. Uh, versus the government having too much of a control over everything that they're doing. So we're trying to understand from them where that separation is. Uh, in all honesty, the confusion was clear for at least 30, 45 minutes on what are you talking about? So China sees industry and, and the government as one and the same, a partnership. It's the same thing. They don't separate as easily as we do. So they control... Uh, literally, they control industry far more, right, than what they do here. It's like controlling everything. And uh, uh, as a result of that, then they can infuse money into industry in the certain areas or not. So they can control that. We don't control that here in the United States. In our nation, it's free capitalism and, and so forth. So, uh, uh, so you have to convince ones here why they infuse money into it, where should it come from. So China is always going to be until they change uh, the way they do business, then China is always going to have an opportunity to put money in where the United States may not have that same opportunity, right? So it's not something we don't look at, we don't consider, we can't, we can't put money where we want, but 
but we have to justify that and we have to uh, be uh, stewards of taxpayer dollars. So it's just a different process. So, uh, so that's going to happen. Where might you get that money? That's a really good question as well. Um, one, there could be new money, right? How do we know that? Because when we went, went to uh, Afghanistan, we had the conflicts, everything, then we, we simply spent trillions of dollars that we didn't have. Now we have a huge deficit. So you can, you can go get money, right? That's a way. You infuse more money in the economy. Uh, what we often do, uh, which is another approach to getting money, is if you're going to put something new out, you might be getting rid of something old. If you get rid of something old, it probably has some kind of funding associated to maintain it, sustain it into today and then to tomorrow for a certain period of time. One might go back and say, well, maybe if we're not going to keep doing those, we're going to replace it. We should slow down and reduce the money we're expending to sustain that old and use that money to start supporting the new, right? It's not a clean sweep. Sometimes, it, sometimes you just whack it off and say, we're done. And other times it kind of tapers, right? But a way to look for, for resources, and, and that is looked at by the department. Okay, what is this going to replace? Are we, are, do we really need to keep funding at, at the same levels? Maybe you taper it off, maybe you kill it. But could we use some of those resources to go do that? And a lot of times, uh, <laughs> maybe the Army, Navy, and Air Force Marines all want the same kind of capability. If, we're, if they're not working together, then those non-recurring engineer costs get paid what? How many times? One per service, right? So what you want to do is have them work together so we only pay those kind of costs one time instead of four different times, right? So uh, the Army's working with electric and hydroelectric vehicles. They're working with the Marine Corps. Lockstep with them, right? So they share that information. We try not to duplicate efforts. So you want to watch for duplication of efforts, and they do that actively. And that also brings in, uh, frees up resources as well, um, if that helps. Um, yeah, that was it. I'll leave that. I think you can. Um, you know, it goes kind of ties back to your second question you had originally. How's America get involved, right? What what do we want? What do we want citizens to go do? You know, they really need to pay attention. You ask them to pay attention. Ask them to get involved. Ask them to raise those hard questions, right? Ask them where do we where where might I help? How I what was it was a comment before? Don't ask what you can do. Don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You're almost back to that again, right? So, so how does the American individual help us in the places we need to go and where we need to go do it? I, th I think those kinds of conversations are way politically charged, but, but those kinds of things need to happen at the local level and the national level, and those kind of questions like that have to, uh, uh, have to come out. I can tell you from, from the Department of Defense side, there's no bashful people out there. They're all asking those questions, right? And... Uh, so, so how might you spread that across in, in other uh, uh, places? I'm just not, I think that's a political answer that I'll, probably, I'll try to steer away from. But, but I think you have to get the people to, get, to ask those questions. Thanks. So, uh, you know, um, an autocratic government like China does have certain advantages when it comes to economic policy, and that is control. We do not want, as the United States, leader of the free world, we can't match control mechanism for control mechanism with, with China, right? 
compete. So we can't, we have to compete on the things that we are good at, which is innovation and bringing private capital to, to, to an issue, all right? So that's our pathway to competition. Sadly, you know, China, you know, dominates the production right now on wind turbines, power management, uh, um, um, solar panels, uh, jet aircraft engines, and all of that is technology that is either stolen from the United States or that we failed to commercialize, all right? So we're very good at developing, not so good at commercializing, and we've, you know, a, a, then sort of a false narrative is that the government shouldn't pick winners and losers. That's rubbish. Our government has always picked winners when it was in our strategic national interest to do so, all right? The government built canals, built railroads, uh, uh, built, uh, uh, invested in coal, invested in oil, invested in space race, invested in the internet. You know, every industry that was considered of national importance, the U.S. government played a role in the initial investments to bring those technologies to the market, and the clean energy transition should be no different, all right? So don't, don't tolerate for one minute this notion we, we shouldn't, the government shouldn't have a hand in this. It's strategically critical that the United States be part of the clean energy transition. It's to our strategic national interest, and we must invest in that. And I think, relatively speaking, we've been doing a very good job, all right, and there's lots of facts and figures on the White House webpage and others about the private capital that has now been freed up thanks to the pieces of legislation that Jessica mentioned. But to Stan's point, you know, the White House says this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. Well, it's once-in-a-generation because we're out of money, all right? So the Western countries have leveraged up all of their debt, their national debt, and now when we need it to invest in climate change or the global south, that money's not there, which comes back to you must have a public-private solution. The public sector has to do things in the market. So that like, might be take the first risk. So syndicate risk for projects or technologies. Uh, provide loans like the DOE's loan program office, all right? So you have sort of a concessionary loan. And so while this is some public money, it's really bringing a lot of private sector money uh, to the table. In terms of communications, I mean, sadly, the United States is having a problem communicating uh, on difficult policy issues. But in terms of climate change, I would say that there is a, I'm gonna read it for you here. Um, the Yale program on climate communications, so Yale University, full disclosure alum. But anyway, they have had a 20 plus year study on how to communicate on American attitudes and how to communicate to Americans on climate change. So if you go to a republic and you say you want to add government regulation for clean energy, they'll say no. If you say, we want to help you get solar panels so your farm can be more energy resilient and independent, they'll say yes, all right? So it's, there is a way to communicate that will be more effective. There's a fantastic book called Saving Us by Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Um, go to your lo local library, it's everywhere. Um, it, it's a really great book on how to communicate uh, climate and, and these transition issues. Uh, and with that, sadly, we are out of time. So to all of the questions I did not get to, I am very sorry. Thank you so much to our panelists uh, for your thoughts and insights today. Uh, if we did not get to your question, feel free to shoot me an email or email us at ASB. Uh, visit our website. Uh, we've got lots of fun stuff there. Thank you all for coming today, and we will see you next time.